Welcome to the Teaching Capsule 7. It's my pleasure to introduce the resource person, Dr. Manoj Edirisuria. Dr. Edirisuria is a consultant physician, so consultant intensivist who is working at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. Uh, this capsule is on acid based disorders. Over to you, Manoj. Um, right, thank you, uh, Chairperson, Madam, um, uh, for the introduction. So uh, I'm uh, going to talk to you regarding the acid-based disorders, but I'm not sure whether this is the best time of the day to uh, discuss uh, rather a bit complicated uh, matters related to these uh, acids and base in, inside our body. Uh, but anyway, I'll try to... Uh, take you through some of the interesting developments over the years regarding uh, how people are looking at the acid-base status and the issues related to that. Um, or also, I will uh, the, take some of the examples, so some of the cases just to apply this knowledge and uh, see how best we can get something out of this. Probably uh, for the initial half of the presentation, I'll try to concentrate on what is called this traditional approach of uh, acid-base disorders. And latter half is probably going to be a bit of a, a different approach. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar, but uh, I would advise if you are getting a little confused, just forget about the latter half of the presentation. So acid-based disorders are very common. Um, only thing is everybody uh, doesn't get the luxury of doing acid-based because it's very expensive and it's not widely available, but as an uh, the, the practitioner in intensive care unit. So it's uh, our one of the bedside uh, tests and it's a routine habit uh, to uh, the decide management on the patient's tra trajectories based on the acid-based status. Uh, so interpreting acid-based people uh, <clears throat> find it a, bit, a little bit uh, complex, but it's obviously an art and which employs different methods of uh, uh, analyzing, uh, hopefully, I will try to introduce some of the things that some of you would have uh, used in the future. Uh, and then um, the, uh, when it comes to the analysis of acid-based disorders, it's mainly uh, more of physiology rather than chemistry. Otherwise, what it sounds like is a bit of chemistry, which is not the case. And um, the acid-based disorders might be dynamic inside a single person. And also, it may be different from one person to other, even though they are having uh, kind of same uh, the illness. Uh, so this acid base analysis and electrolyte analysis are importantly not two different things and it is a same thing so you realize as the uh, slides are going. So this is a first case and a simp a rather simple looking case. So you get a young man uh, who hasn't got any past medical history uh, he's a kind of thin built person coming with abdominal pain and vomiting. Maybe a bit of a popular case uh, you might find in exams. And he looks a bit drowsy, dehydrated, and he's uh, tachypneic. He's maintaining oxygenation, but he's tachycardic, and uh, probably he's in a uh, compensated uh, shock status. So this is the blood gas. So you get a pH of 7.33, PaCO220. So I'm rather jumping into mathematics straight away. Um, uh, try to uh, <clears throat> concentrate on these numbers and uh, see what you can get out of it. And bicarb is 14, standard base access is minus nine and lactate is 2.9. So I'll give you some labs as well. And uh, you might see importantly this uh, amylase, sorry, amylase is 800. Okay. Uh, Hopefully you would try to work out some of the diagnosis out of this clinical picture. So you get a young man, abdominal pain, maybe after a bout of alcohol or something, we don't know. And there is a high amylase. So you would rather think whether this, is, this can be uh, pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, right? Okay, we'll see what it is really. So how do you analyze the blood gas? <clears throat> so as I said earlier, there are different methods. 
principally there are two methods. One is called the traditional method. So that is what uh, most of us are familiar with. That is introduced by the Henderson and Hasselberg in uh, early 1900s. And later on, Stuart came into the picture, which is called the modernist uh, approach to uh, analyze the acid base. So we'll see. Uh, we'll first go by this uh, traditional method since most of us are um, familiar with this method. And if I just uh, give you the uh, steps, it's a matter of uh, one, two, three, four, five. It's a matter of uh, five, 10 minutes to finish the presentation, but I will just try to uh, uh, discuss some of the basis behind uh, most of these steps, which may be uh, of interest to some of you. Right, so acid-based analysis, uh, uh, as I said earlier, so there is one thing called the traditionalist bicarbonate base approach. I, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with that approach. And he, there, of course, there are again two methods. One is base excess uh, uh, equations and also the bicarb to CO2 uh, ratio. So this uh, base excess story uh, came from uh, Copenhagen and uh, it is mid 1900s. And actually the bicarb to CO2, uh, the ratio was the initial introduction by Henderson and Hasselberg. And then uh, when it comes to the strong iron approach, uh, the, it was also based on this original thought of the Singer and Hastings in 1940s. And later on, Stuart used the same principle to analyze it in a better way. So, um, so if you look at this uh, two gentlemen in the picture, so Henderson and Hasselbeck, so they um, introduced this concept that uh, your pH, pH is the, uh, the negative logarithmic of the H ion concentration. I will just show you it a little later. And that will depend on the ratio between the bicarbonate concentration and carbonic acid concentration, or else you can say, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So this ratio has to be a constant one in order to keep the pH stable or in a single value. So what you can understand is if you get an acidotic patient, your bicarb will be low. So the CO2 also should be going down in order to maintain a, a stable pH. That is what you call is compensation. So if bicarb is low, you need to have a low carbon dioxide if bicarb is rising, or in other words, if the carbon dioxide is rising in a case of respiratory acidosis, bicarb also should be rising as a compensatory mechanism, simple as that. So everything is there in this, uh, the equation. So generally uh, in a no person with a normal physiology, the, this, the ratio uh, between the bicarb to partial pressure of carbon dioxide remains at 20 to 1, 20 to 1. And if uh, compensatory mechanisms are unable to maintain that ratio, as I'm going to tell you later, uh, pH will be altered and then we call it a decompensated state. So important thing is that they thought uh, pH is determined by the proton ion concentration, that is proton concentration or H ion concentration or, and the bicarbonate concentration. They thought the independent variables of pH inside the body are protons and the bicarbs. So if you go back to the, if you remember the previous, I just show you the blood gas. Uh, what is the diagnosis out of this? Uh, I can give you um, maybe uh, 15 seconds, like what we are doing at the bedside. So we we'll start uh, analyzing this and uh, we'll see what the responses are. It's only 15 seconds. So still, I don't see any uh, attempts. Um, so we'll wait for another 10 seconds. Yep. 
you can type your response in the uh, chat box of the Zoom. A, B, C, D, O, E. All right, so uh, I think uh, maybe some of you are a bit struggling, so I will just show you the answer is high anion gap metabolic acidosis plus respiratory alkalosis, and there is a metabolic alkalosis also. So can you use the traditionalist approach to uh, work out all this within 15 to 20 seconds is the question. So we'll see how it is being analyzed according to the traditionalist method. So again, as I said earlier, it's bicarb uh, according to the Boston rule and base access according to the Copenhagen uh, rule to analyze this blood gas. Uh, so this buffer based uh, concept initially um, introduced by Singer and Hastings in 1948, uh, there is uh, no big logic here. Actually, it's the difference between the main cations and the main anions in the plasma. You know that sodium uh, always remains higher than the chloride in order to maintain uh, certain physiological functions, including the membrane uh, excitation and also some of the release of hormones, ac the action of the, the some of the enzymes. This uh, difference in uh, the uh, main cations and anions is important, uh, which is thought to be the main regulatory factor by Singer and Hastings uh, on this, what is called buffer base. Buffer base is the so buffers available to uh, maintain this uh, electrical neutrality and also the pH at a stable state. So when the buffer base is uh, going to be expanded uh, due to uh, whatever the reason, so it is called base excess at that time. And when the buffer base is going to be constricted, it is called the uh, base deficit. So base deficit, as you can understand simply, is acidosis and base excess is alkalosis. So based on this, uh, the Astrop and uh, the Siga Henderson, uh, the, they introduced the, they redefined the concept of base excess as the dose of acido base required to return the pH of a blood sample to 7.4 normal. So it is measured at 37 degrees Celsius and uh, CO2 of 40. So this is done in vitro and some of the electrodes are used to do this. And of course, this will eliminate the, without this will eliminate the effect of pre-existing metabolic abnormalities, probably due to high CO2. But uh, what is uh, observed is, even after the correction, they have noticed that as the, PO, C, uh, the CO2 concentration is going up, patients uh, are having a, uh, a element of acidosis. This is explained by this, uh, the action of the hemoglobin as a buffer and so that uh, they have corrected the base excess to uh, hemoglobin of five. So you are looking at the base excess in an anemic blood sample to standardize it so that it is called standard base excess. So that is, the, uh, that is how it came in 1950s, standard base excess. So most of the blood gases we see both values. And I think I would advise you to go by the standard base excess because it is corrected to the uh, standardized numbers. Right, so then we are coming to the compensatory mechanism. So we know that there was a mm, predominant acid-based disorder, whether it's uh, acidosis or alkalosis. And uh, according to the whatever the abnormality, you need to have a compensatory mechanism, as I said earlier. So if there is a respiratory uh, acid-based disorder, that is say, for example, respiratory acidosis, there has to be a, a compensatory metabolic alkalosis. And uh, so that you need to, uh, the provide uh, some bicarb from kidney. Kidney need to come into the picture. If there is a metabolic acidosis, on the other hand, so respiratory system should uh, be uh, uh, sensing that, and then it should uh, wash out some of the CO2s to keep the direction of both numbers in the same same direction, right? So in addition to these main two systems, there are a number of other compensatory mechanisms. For example, if you get a status epilepticus patient, a patient, if you do a blood gas immediately after the uh, seizure episode, you might see that lactates are high, but this uh, respiratory compensation may not be immediately adequate to clear up the lactate. So probably that it may be the liver which is coming into action to normalize the acid-base disorder. <clears throat> so as I said earlier, 
So there are main four types of acid-based disorders. And all the time, as I said earlier, this, uh, the, the arrows remain in the same direction. So then I think it's easy to uh, analyze the acid-based disorder, but if this uh, direction of arrows are on uh, different ways, so then we know there has to be a mixed acid-based disorder. So how do you know whether if there is a rest metabolic acidosis, whether this respiratory compensation is adequate? So this is very, very important to make decisions regarding deteriorating patients. So you use what is called Winter's formula. So you calculate the expected carbon dioxide level to the patient's acid base status. So if you look at the previous case, so patient was having a bicarb of 14. So we still go by the traditionalist bicarb-based approach. And you have a 14 of bicarb, so into 1.5 times, that is 21 plus 8 is 29. So and plus or minus 2. So you get uh, the uh, patient's uh, carbon dioxide level 26 and uh, the expected value 27, more or less the expected number. But what will happen if the patient's actual bicarb level is far higher than the expected number? Say, for example, patient's CO2 level is 40. So it looks normal, but it is not normal simply because patient's compensatory mechanisms are X, we call it exhausted. So that may be the time where you need to make a decision whether we need to support this patient, especially those who are having comorbidities and elderly, they will not have very strong respiratory, respiratory capacity to uh, the compensate for worsening metabolic acidosis. So at one stage, if you are not going to uh, reverse the process, you need to probably support the respiration, otherwise patient is going to get a respiratory arrest and a cardiac arrest. And similarly, if you are having uh, too much of carbon dioxide washout than the expected value, so then we know there is a additional respiratory alkalosis the component, maybe patient is hyperventilating or maybe some other mechanisms coming into play. So as I said earlier, again, this acid base and fluids and electrolytes are no two different concepts. And maybe one of the mistakes is that during our medical school days, so we learned those as two in two different chapters as a two different topic, but it's not really a two different topics. So uh, you will realize as we go on. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, have a look at the acid base, uh, sorry, the acid definition for the acids and bases. And so Arrhenius in 19, so that was early, uh, the late 1800s, 18, uh, 18, uh, so 1883, I think, uh, the, he has introduced this concept called acids are producing hydrogen ions, and it is the opposite for the bases. So they are basically talking about the protons or hydrogen ions and electrons, whether to uh, whether the capacity is to donate or ac the, accept them. Based on that, they decided uh, uh, the agent as an acid or a base. So the, it is expressed as a pH, which is the negative logarithmic of the H ion concentration. And uh, if you remember the chemistry that we learned during the school days, so you have acid on one hand, so you can add a base to neutralize the acid. So I think we know that that is going to be a very dangerous chemical reaction. So a lot of energy is going to be emitted, which is never going to happen in a, uh, the uh, physiological uh, the living being. And instead, there are different other mechanisms come into play in order to buffer these changes. So buffering is that you keep the pH stable by neutralizing acidic or basic uh, abnormalities. So if you look at the extravascular, uh, sorry, the extracellular fluid, that is basic, mainly the intravascular compartment, as I said earlier, there is definitely a difference between the main cations and the anions. So that is to maintain the uh, various physiological functions. And it is uh, uh, more or less similar in the interstitial fluid also, but it is entirely different to the intracellular state. So when there is something uh, different happening in the, uh, the uh, intravascular compartment and similar intracellular compartment, there always there can be exchange of these electrolytes in order to make a difference to this. But this is not something which is mainly discussed in the traditionalist approach. So that's why sometimes you might know that the dominant acid-based disorder is there, 
and there is a compensatory mechanism, but it may be really difficult to find what the cause for the acid-based disorder is. To work it out, I think traditionalist uh, mindset is a little bit struggling. So this uh, concept called anion gap came in 1960s and this paper is in 1977. And this is mainly based on the electrolyte changes, how it behaves in acid-based uh, disorders. So as I said earlier, anion gap is the uh, uh, the count, uh, the anion gap is the number which is used to work out what the cause for the acid-based disorder is. So it is basically calculated as, a, as the difference between the main anions and the main cations. So you know main cations are sodium and potassium. Usually we don't use the potassium uh, for the equation unless patient is having some high potassium levels due to renal impairment or some other disorder. So it's mainly the sodium minus chloride minus bicarb. So normal anion gap remains somewhere around 12. What that uh, indicates is the amount of unmeasured anions inside the body. So this unmeasured anion is anion, uh, the concentration might change in a acid-based disorder. So if there is acidosis, unmeasured anion might go up, especially when it is high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And the problem is if it remains normal, like in a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, how do we explain this using the traditionalist approach? Traditionalist, the bicarb-based approach don't talk about the chlorine-related chlorine issue. So it may be a bit of an issue if you are just uh, trying to uh, do the medical reasoning using this traditionalist approach. So <clears throat> if you look at the anion gap of that said case initially, so it is going to be 38, which is definitely more than normal range, which is 12 to 16. 16 is if you are using the potassium. And uh, there is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So does this answer our question? Uh, can we work out uh, the cause for this? Of course, it's difficult because there are a number of causes. There may be mixed causes also. So how do you know whether there is a mixed acidosis? So I think uh, before that, you can use any of these, um, the, what is called these uh, mnemonics to remember the high anion gap and normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. I'm sure that you all know that. So what we need to understand is the basis behind this. So this uh, concept called the delta gap or the delta ratio came in 1990s to more elaborate on the cause of the, uh, the acidosis if there is a acid-based disorder. So you know that uh, this uh, di uh, the diagram that I was showing you several times is called uh, uh, the Gamble. Graham Gamble is uh, uh, the American pediatrician and a physiologist. So he was just using this to show the electrical neutrality in the body, what, uh, the anions and cations. And uh, the normal stage will assume like this, so you get bicarb uh, level double the anion gap. So usually anion gap is 12, bicarb level is 24. So what will happen if there is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis? So you get the, the chloride, chloride, chloride uh, the iron level up. So your anion gap remains normal, but bicarb is squeezed. So you have acidosis. And according to the, uh, the henderson Hasselbach. And then uh, when there's a mix acidosis, you get chloride a little bit elevated and you get your anion gap also expanded. So bicarb is again squeezed, you get a mix acidosis. So then the ratio between the anion gap difference or what we call the delta anion gap and the delta uh, bicarb, that is the, dif the drop of bicarb versus rise of anion gap. And uh, that is going to be 0.4 to point, uh, less than 0.4 in the no normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. And there may be a mixed acidosis if the ratio is going to be 0.4 to 0.8. And if there is a PO expansion of the anion gap due to unmeasured anions, uh, but chloride remains more or less normal, then we call it high anion gap metabolic acidosis. As you can see that uh, the fourth one, the gambogram is total opposite of the normal level. So bicarb level is squeezed to half of the anion gap. So you get a significantly high ratio. And when it is too high, we know that there is additional uh, factor coming in. Maybe there is additional level of uh, the bicarb uh, due to some other additional metabolic alkalosis. So I think uh, try to understand this concept and it may be useful for a traditionalist to work out the 
uh, blood gas uh, disorder. And uh, in this particular case, we get a uh, delta ratio of uh, 2.6. So then you know there is a uh, mixed acidosis in addition to the higher NAN gap, there is a metabolic alkalosis also. And uh, so how, how do you explain that? Uh, so you need to probably, step one, probably need to interpret the blood gas. Then step two, you need to find the etiology. For the step one, you know that uh, the, all the steps that we were discussing, first you need to uh, the, uh, work out what the dominant acid-base disorder, whether it's a metabolic or respiratory, if it is metabolic, alkalosis or acidosis. And then you need to calculate the anion gap in order to see whether there is a uh, anion gap expansion or normal level. And then you need to see the delta ratio to see whether there is a, uh, the mixed acidosis. And also it's important to uh, work out whether there is a adequate compensation. It matters with regard to the further management. And then uh, you can decide whether this is a simple or mixed acid-based disorder, but that is not going to be everything. You need to work out the etiology for this, like in our case. Um, so you need to basically go by the clinical uh, history examination, and also you can incorporate other numbers, especially uh, blood testing, routine labs, and also a smaller gap, urine and an gap, and things are also important. I'm not going to talk about everything, but I think you need to realize, depending on the case, you need to employ some of these. Um, so first case, we know that uh, the high anion gap metabolic acidosis in a background of high uh, blood glucose level, which was found to be 328, and ketones are plus plus, and ultrasound shows normal pancreas. It's not the uh, pancreas which is causing the rise in the amylase. Don't get deceived. So it is basically due to the decay itself. You are, uh, the, uh, the amylase level has gone up. So there is a DKA and metabolic alkalosis can be explained by vomiting. So there is an interesting uh, uh, the assumption related to the vomiting in the traditional scam where they think that the vomiting is due to loss of protons, loss of H ions due to the uh, vomit, the, the loss of uh, uh, the gastric contents. Gastric contents, you know that the pH is, uh, so the pH is, seven, the pH is basically one there is a high concentration of acids. And then uh, uh, for a little, little vomit, if you are going to lose H ions in that concentration, you will probably lose the whole uh, H ion concentration inside the body, but that is not what is really happening in vomiting. And you will, I can, I mean, explain it using the, the words. Uh, within 12 hours, so this was managed and, Actually speaking, uh, we see that approach to manage the di diabetic ketoacidosis in most of the trainees are very poor because they all think that uh, the management of acidosis, not the management of acidosis, they all think that management of glucose level is the important thing in the diabetic ketoacidosis. So everybody goes behind uh, the glucose level and at one stage when the glucose level start dropping, they stop the uh, the insulin infusion, which is the life-saving treatment there. But instead, I would advise that one single blood gas is not the matters you need to do, repeated blood gases to see whether there is an adequate correction of the metabolic disorder rather than the glucose level. So you need to separately manage the glucose. So you need to uh, get the, uh, the acid-based disorder corrected by using insulin. So the targets are uh, very clearly to correct the bicarb level, base excess, and the anion gap. So that is the most important message out of that case, which is very, very common and very commonly mismanaged. So as you are managing the case, so this is a kind of a pattern recognition. So you give uh, IV fluids to correct the fluid deficit, and then you uh, uh, continue the insulin and you adjust the insulin dose according to the acid-base disorder. And after some time, uh, patient improves, but within 12 hours, patient again get drowsy. So patient is again becoming tachypneic and uh, your heart rate goes up and people think there's an insulin resistance or something, you are going to increase the insulin dose. But I think more than increasing the insulin dose, you need to do a, another blood gas and see what is really happening there. So if you look at this blood gas after 12 hours, what has happened, actually the acidosis, the pH level as worse, and if you remember the first one, pH was 7.35. That was fully compensated, but here, of course, there is a decompensation. And if you dig into the 
uh, whole thing, you have to work out what the real reason for this decompensation. <clears throat> so how do you explain this? Uh, so what is going to be the acid-based disorder here? Uh, of course, the previous one, we had additional metabolic alkalosis. Uh, in this one, uh, if I show you the calculations, so anion gap is 16, which is more or less normal or a little bit higher than the normal level probably. And the, uh, the delta ratio, delta ratio comes as 0.5, that is, you know, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis plus high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So how do you explain the normal anion gap metabolic acidosis according to the traditionalist approach? And uh, so that is going to be a bit of a trouble. So we are not talking about the chloride in the traditionalist approach. I will just explain it in the next half of the uh, talk. So uh, we'll uh, go to another case. So this is uh, the, all these cases are that uh, patients that we are frequently managing intensive care setup. And this is uh, another patient who was transferred to us uh, from another hospital and patient was found unconscious by the roadside. He, he was basically unconscious, so he was intubated in the emergency department and he was tachypneic, tachycardic, the usual picture. So he was so sick, so intubated on admission to the emergency department after resuscitating some, some in the IV fluid. I think this uh, IV fluid resuscitation is another uh, interesting part uh, because uh, the Anybody who's sick due to acidosis, alkalosis, or whatever, we used to give some IV fluids. So we really don't know what we are going to achieve by giving IV fluids. And sometimes people give IV fluid, and in addition to that, you give fruzimide also. Sometimes uh, morning you give IV fluids, evening you give fruzimide. So sometimes we don't work out the picture, we just do something, and sometimes we don't understand what the real basis behind. And so this patient, since unconscious, rightly had a CT brain, which shows my uh, cerebral edema. And uh, blood glucose level is seven. It is not the cause for the uh, unconscious level, unconsciousness. And the blood urea remains to a little bit elevated. And serum osmolarity, interestingly, came as 336, which is, of course, higher than the usual physiological osmolarity, which is seen in the blood, which is somewhere around 290. So if you look at the, uh, the labs and the other numbers, uh, so this uh, blood gas is obviously severely acidotic and patient is having a standard base excess of minus 18 and it, it is uh, partially compensated by the respiratory but obviously you know that unconscious patient is not going to fully compensate for that. Uh, that's why rightly his uh, control over the respiration was taken over and then if you look at the sodium is 128, chloride 92 and uh, lactate 5.9, does it explain everything? So lactate is high, not surprisingly. Can you explain this level of degree of acidosis just by using this lactate level? Of course, we are fortunate to see that lactate is there in most of the blood gases nowadays. We are, I mean, it's a, uh, the compulsory, uh, the specification for uh, Ministry of Health blood gas machines. So it's quite uh, easy, but just because of the high lactate, are you going to conclude it as a lactic acidosis? So of course, I'm, it's not the case simply because we know that lactate is not going to elevate the osmolarity this much. So there should be something different. But unfortunately, there is no history available. This is somebody found by the side of the road. And uh, if you look, look at the analysis, so what is going to be your answer? So of course, the, the, the clever one will pick either D or E simply because there is a smaller pro osmolarity problem. Um, so is it respiratory acidosis plus or smaller gap high anion acidosis or smaller gap plus normal acid base status? So obviously it's not normal. So you can easily work out even without knowing how to analyze the blood gas, the D is going to be the answer. So how does how do you come to that conclusion? And uh, we know that predominant acid base disorder again is a severe metabolic acidosis as evidenced by the behavior of bicarb and CO2 according to the traditionalist approach, CO2 has gone down and by the, the gone down and the carbon dioxide also has gone down to a lesser degree. So that is why the decompensation is, so ratio is net maintained and it can be further explained by the standard base excess as well. And if you look at the, the delta ratio, it is one, which is high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And there is a smaller gap you, which you need to calculate here. So which is 97, very, very, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, significantly high, but uh, we need to probably make a correction for the 
sodium level because we know that when there are osmotically active particles, sodium will be uh, the factitiously low. So without making that correction, we are just looking at this smaller gap. So obviously, when there is a high or smaller gap, higher than gap metabolic acidosis, you need to entertain the, uh, the toxic alcohols and glycol. Right, so we are looking at another case. Which, uh, the, we, uh, last week or so, we had this patient in the emergency department, young boy coming with uh, shortness of breath in the background of uh, diagnosed asthma. And he was uh, a bit uh, uh, the confused and a little you know, disturbed in the emergency department. Uh, tachypneic heart rate was 132, blood pressure 92, and lungs. Uh, there were ronchi and uh, reduction of air entry bilaterally and saturation red as 88. So they were trying nebulization and oxygen, the face mask oxygen initially, but not uh, much improving. So then they have started giving IV salbutamol as well, thinking it's al the silent lung, which is not the case. And chest X-ray was also taken just to see why he's not responding. The chest X-ray was normal. And our patient settled after a while after giving some more nibs. Uh, so this was a blood gas, as you can see, pH of 7.26, CO2 is obviously high, and somebody, uh, young patient, asthmatic, breathing at a rate of 36, I would expect CO2 to be somewhere around 20s, but even a CO2 which looks normal will not be normal in a patient who's tachypneic, like in this case, and CO2 is obviously a little high, so there is a respiratory acidosis, and uh, the bicarb level, uh, there is some compensation. We know that uh, for the acute respiratory acidosis, compensation is not going to be that quick like a respiratory compensation for a metabolic acidosis. So it might take a little while. And uh, if you look at this case, the patient settled after a while. That is good. So they have given uh, the beta uh, the stimulants to open up the, the, the airways. And uh, what is the, the acid-based disorder you are seeing here is a respiratory acidosis with uh, partially compensation by, compensated by metabolic alkalosis. And after a while, uh, patient remains well, but patient started becoming tachypneic again. That was around three to four hours later. So what they did was they thought, okay, now this may be due to the uh, recurring of uh, bronchospasm. They gave more and more. Uh, nebulization and they started the IV salbutamol again, right? So now what has happened? The clinical picture looks more or less the same. So if you look at the blood gas, answer is there. So now the picture has totally reversed. So there is an obvious acidosis and a pH of 7.21 with a CO2 level 30. Of course, you are seeing good washout of the carbon dioxide at this point. And bicarb level has dropped to 40. Now, initially it was respiratory acidosis. Now there is a predominant metabolic acidosis. So how come this be explained? So I think uh, <clears throat> the answer is going to be uh, the high anion gap metabolic acidosis and respiratory alcohol if you work out all the numbers. And this is the simple explanation. When you are doing too much of beta stimulation, increase glycolysis, lipolysis, so you get more and more acids coming into the circulation, causing a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that idea is to not to give too much of nebulizations, and you need to read the patient's improvement. So this is another case. I would uh, like to give you uh, 30 seconds. Now you have some idea as to how we need to work out this blood gas disorders. Uh, so shall I give you uh, 30 seconds from this point onwards? And please. Uh, uh, type the right answer. I can see the answers now for the initial one. And now shall we give a try to answer this one? So this is a uh, the 68-year-old male coming with type 2 diabetes, fever, dysuria, vomiting, looks like a, a urosepsis. And he was tachypneic. And blood gas was done. It shows a pH of 7.24 and a bicarb level of 10 which is uh, very, very low. And standard base excess reads minus 18. And you have a sodium 152, chloride 92, and lactate of 5.1 with the albumin of 28. So CO2 reads 28. So what is going to be the answer? Again, uh, bedside quick analysis.
So I can see some answers coming in. So everybody thinks B and one person is there with E and B's are there, D's are there. Okay. I can see a couple of E's and a lot of B's and some D's also. And some people think it's C is the answer. Okay, more and more E's. All oh, right. And another C. Okay, now time is up. So I think uh, traditionalists uh, might be struggle to work out this blood gas simply because you need to work out the, the anion gap, delta ratios, and so on. But of course, uh, the, uh, the Stewart's camp might uh, find it quite easy to analyze this blood gas if you go by the, uh, the whatever the method that I'm going to discuss next. Uh, so we, we have another 20 minutes or so. So this physiological approach is the uh, traditional approach that we were following. And uh, there was a huge uh, debate as to which one is going to be the better one, physiological, physiological or physiochemical. So physiochemical approach is the one introduced by Stuart. Actually, what we need to do is not to have a quarrel between the two, but we need to have a, a kind of a marriage between the two concepts, and then we need to use it to work out our common blood gas disorders at the bedside. So this uh, picture, some of you would have seen the uh, Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Galileo Galilei is there. So there was uh, uh, the, the uh, debate regarding whether the, the Earth is at the center of the universe and the sun is rotating around the Earth. Or then later on, Galileo Galilei uh, followed, I mean, uh, going by the Copernicus rule, he said, know that uh, heliocentrism, that is the sun is in the middle and we are rotating around the Earth. So the church was uh, furious, so Galileo was expelled from the church. So, but like what Galileo said, Stuart also went in a totally different ideology here. He said that uh, the giants, that is the protons and bicarbs are not the determinants of pH, but they are rather dependent factors, what really determines the pH are three factors. One is strong ion difference, and two is total weak acid concentration and the carbon dioxide. So actually based on that, H plus might change and that is going to be the dependent factor. So we'll see how it occurs. <clears throat> so it's interesting to see amount of H ions that is available inside the bodies, just 40 nanomoles. Right. So compared to that, we have a lot of uh, uh, the uh, strong ions, that is sodium and chloride, 140, and the water is 55.3 moles. So that is 55,000 millimoles compared to 40 nanomoles of H ions. So this itself explains that H ions concentration is not going to be the decisive factor of the pH. This is what the uh, basis for the Stewart's theory. So H ion concentration is rather very, very low to decide on the pH, but this change of H ion concentration obviously changes the pH, but that change is not due to the H ion per se, but it is something else coming into the picture to change this. And this Stewart approach was based on two principles, electrical neutrality, that you have equal amount of the cations and anions, and other one is the conservation of the mass, these H ions are not going to be inserted to the blood or it is not going to be removed in order to make the patient acidotic or alkalotic, but it's a matter of changing the existing uh, the elements due to whatever the other factors, those are strong ion difference, ATOT and the CO2. So if you look at this, uh, the gamble gram again, you have sodium and chloride maintaining the electrical neutrality in the first picture. And the uh, second picture, you have sodium level gone up and chloride remains the same. So to, to fill up that gap, some hydroxyl ions are coming in. Who's going to give this hydroxyl ions is the question. And in the other diagram, sodium level remains the normal, chloride level has gone up, and there is H ions coming into the picture to fill up this gap. So it's... Uh, the basis for this Stuart theory is the water dissociation. He thought, this is the uh, famous seed that you might see, he's going to be in the water. So this seed is going to 
decide on the water dissociation. So water will be dis very, very uh, little degree, water will be dissociated to hydroxyl ions and uh, the protons. And this uh, amount of the, the degree of difference between the strong anions and the cations are going to change this situation. If there is a larger anion gap, then more and more H ions will be coming into the, uh, the solution due to water dissociation. But it's important to realize that hydroxyl ion into H ion, the uh, product is a constant. So if your H ions are going up in the solution, hydroxyl ion will go down. So that is what is going to decide the, the uh, pH level. And the, what is meant by a strong acid or strong anion, strong cation, those are the anions or cations totally dissociated in the water. So for example, if you put some salt, kitchen salt that is sodium chloride into water, that will be totally dissociated to charged sodium and charged chloride. They will never meet as long as they are inside the water. So that is how uh, the strong anions behave. So in contrast, the weak acids that he was uh, talking about as a tot are the stuff which are very, uh, you know, partially dissociated depending on the pH and the concentration of relevant, uh, the uh, weak acid. So this, uh, pa the, the, uh, the concentrations are going to decide the uh, the water dissociation. And this uh, strong ion difference is the same as the one I uh, explained to you initially uh, introduced by Singer and Hastings, uh, but uh, there is a different term now being used. Now this buffer base concept is less popular now, but in this diagram, what you can see is as the, the acid is reduced, the pH will be more and more acidotic. So I think you might see more and more exam questions related to SID in the future. So better to try and understand this. If the strong ion difference is squeezed or small, you will get more and more acidotic. If the strong ion difference is enlarged, you will get more and more alkalotic. So now there is a new definition to the acids according to the steward uh, compared to when you are comparing it with the Aeneas and uh, Lowry Bronsted Lewis theories. So he said that any agent dissociating or any agent producing hydrogen ions by dissociation of water are going to be the acids. So just try to understand this concept. And then I think probably you can work out most of the acid-based disorder without going into uh, so many calculations. So if you uh, look at the same case again, uh, which has you know, changed over a period of four hours, or 12 hours after resuscitating with a lot of saline, that is sodium chloride, you can see that chloride level has gone up. We saw that there is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, which is also called hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And it is said to be a misnomer because chloride is not acid, but still that is the deciding factor which brings acidosis in, right? So of course, if you look at the strong ion difference here, so it has, the normal strong ion difference is somewhere around 38 to 40. But here, of course, it has squeezed a lot. Sodium has little gone down. Chloride has gone up. So the CD squeeze, we know that there's a metabolic acidosis. And uh, so that is very easy to uh, work out rather than just, uh, you know, calculating all other numbers. Uh, and how do you explain this? Uh, this, what is called, in other words, that is called dilutional acidosis. So you dilute the uh, the plasma or the solution using some more solutions. In this example, so sodium is 140, chloride is 102, similar to plasma, and uh, the pouring some one liter of water, which has a seed of, what is the seed of the water is going to be zero. There is no strong ion difference. And then of course that is going to dilute. So your strong ion difference is going to be uh, reduced from 38 to 19, almost halved. So that is, of, of, of course, going to be a great explanation according to the Stewart's th uh, theory. And uh, probably we can apply the same to this. So CD is being squeezed uh, due to this, uh, the hypochloremia. And so that uh, you get the, the acidosis and with the rise of chlorine. So this was an interesting study by, done by the, the Gattinoni, Carleso and the colleagues. So you can see that in this diagram, uh, here of course, uh, the solution remains at a pH of 7.4, and 
and we are adding some uh, more different different solutions with different strong ion differences to dilute this solution. So as you are adding uh, the uh, the solution with a strong ion difference of zero, that is uh, uh, the water or sodium chloride, we, we would just say. And then what will happen is the pH used to drop. And as you add, as you're adding uh, solution with low strong ion difference, as you are increasing the strong ion difference of the different solutions, so pH used to again go up as you are diluting. And interestingly, these, these are different, different dilution lines, 10%, 20%, 30%, and up to 100%. There was an inter intersecting point at this point. This is called a magic point. And it is said to be similar to the, found to be similar to the bicarbonate level inside the body. So in other words, uh, so what it means is, if you are using a solution to maintain the existing uh, pH of that particular solution or the body, you need to uh, match the strong iron difference of that solution to the bicarb level. So in that example, so if, if you relate this thing to the uh, solution which is used to uh, resuscitate the patient who was having severe metabolic acidosis, uh, so, so sodium chloride is a solution with a strong ion difference of zero. So if you are using a strong ion difference zero solution to maintain a patient's uh, pH, of course, you can see that pH is going to drop. So instead, what you need to go for is a balanced solution. So it is always recommended that you need to use a balanced solution like Ringer's lactate, which is having a strong ion difference close to 25 to 30. So that is going to maintain a good uh, pH if the bicarb level is reasonably corrected. Right. So likewise, this is going to be one of the important points. I think you better read this article and you will uh, get a more insight. And of course, uh, to be honest, I, this is this was the first time I was also reading this article and quite interesting. I would recommend everybody to read this. And the, the, diff the other opposite as aspect is that uh, compared to the dilutional acidosis, there is a concept called contraction alkalosis. Can you explain it using the traditional approach? Of course, traditionalists are trying to say when you are uh, the uh, removing or say, for example, you have a solution and you are going to boil it and get rid of the water. So the concentration of ions are going to be uh, concentrated. So they were trying to say bicarb level is go up because of the, the you know reduction of the water level. Why not the H ion level? So that was the question raised by the Stuart camp. So instead, what is really happening is uh, so something similar to the dilution and acidosis, I'm not going to explain all that, but of course what is really happening is chloride is depleted, increasing the strong ion difference. That is why patient is getting more and more alkalosis. And then when you are uh, fluid depleted, the renin angio system also will come into play, retaining more and more sodium, worsening the, or maybe elevating the, the sodium level more and more. So strong ion difference will be more expanded. So your alkalosis will be, much worse. So other important factor which is totally neglected in the traditionalist approach is the albumin. So the anion gap has uh, not uh, considered albumin, you know, as a separate element. It was also considered as unmeasured anion. So that may be one of the reasons why we need to make a correction for the albumin if you are using the, the traditionalist approach and the anion gap. Of course, anion is a, sorry, albumin is a weak acid. And if the albumin level is going up, what will happen is uh, the patient will get more and more acidotic. And if the albumin level is going down, patient will be alkalotic. So even if somebody is having a significant acidosis in the intensive care, we know their albumin levels are most of the time low. So there is an opposite alkalizing effect. So that is why we need to make a correction for that. So then Stuart is still applicable in that scenario. So I will just skip the this one, and I will come to this uh, uh, as a, probably one of the last cases. Uh, the cardiac arrest scenario, the elderly lady had a cardiac arrest, probably secondary to a cardiac event, and CPR was started after 20 minutes, the blood gas is severely acidotic. So what would you do next? So I, I know that uh, looking at the bicarb of eight and base excess of minus 22, though it is not recommended in the LS guideline, you will jump and give some bicarbonate. So what will happen? This is a cardiac arrest case and you are giving sodium and bicarbonate. There is a concentration of 
8.4% uh, is 1 millimoles per milliliter. So in uh, 50 milliliters, you give 50 millimoles of sodium and bicarbonate. So what are you going to really give? You think that you are giving bicarbonate, but of course, this is a closed system. Patient is in a cardiac arrest. There is no uh, the pulmonary circulation, no CO2 uh, wash out. So what will happen is, so this seed will be, now there is a uh, equal concentration and there is no difference between the strong and difference. Uh, or else we'll say if it is an open system where your car, the bicarb will be converted to CO2 and it will go out of the body, then it's just the sodium that you are adding. And uh, what will happen if you are, uh, you know, diluting a patient who's in a closed system, pH will not change. So that is uh, the regarding the the dilutional, you know, concept that I was just talking about. And this is another, you know, paper, since there is not much of time, I would recommend you to read about this. But the uh, important message is in a cardiac arrest, there is no point of giving bicarbonate as long as there is no perfusion of the lungs. So CO2 won't emit. So it is the sodium which is contributing to the alkalizing effect by increasing the, uh, the strong ion difference. If sodium level is already high, I think it is not going to be useful. So this is the previous question. And the uh, answer is E, yes. So you can see that strong ion difference is quite enlarged, the 152 sodium and chloride is 92. And also there is alkalizing effect due to the albumin also. Here it's 28, less than the normal level of 40. And uh, see, because of all this, but still there is a significant acidosis, which is not, you know, uh, the shown as it is simply because of these alkalizing effects. So that is how you explain. And uh, the, there were some flaws in Stuart approach. They thought uh, it's a single compartment model and uh, they were not talking about a compensatory mechanism. So that is why I said that we need to combine the both concepts in order to uh, the, analyze the blood gases at bedside. And I think this, uh, uh, some more cases are there, but of course we might not have enough time to analyze all that. Again, a 44 year old male alcoholic coming with a picture similar to leptospirosis, severely uh, acidotic, and, uh, but it is partially compensated due to number of factors. Uh, it can be uh, you know, analyzed using the, uh, the Stewart method, but I'm not going to go into detail, but better to read around this. Um, so the same clinical picture uh, changes after giving, resuscitating the patient with two liters of sodium chloride and 0.9% uh, saline. And acidosis has obviously worsened. You can see that sodium chloride gap has the shortened. So you get the, uh, the smaller strong ion difference. And uh, it is kind of uh, uh, opposed by the albumin drop of alkalizing effect. So the pH is not that first, but still he's having both uh, metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis, both factors. And uh, so after three plasma exchanges that we did, patient looks alkalotic. Now the same patient, you can see that picture is changing. So how come you uh, describe this one? So probably it may be related to the, the, the uh, citrate, which is there in the fresh frozen plasma converted to bicarb inside the body, as long as they are having a good liver function. And uh, this is how things are changing. And of course you can see the, uh, the strong ion difference is not much change there, but there are some other alkalizing uh, factors coming in. So you need to read a bit around the lactic acidosis and there are some interesting theories. And this is one of the approach suggested recently to incorporate both the uh, standard uh, approach and the, the modern approach. Uh, so you can look at the base excess, the lactate level and strong ion gap. It is not the strong ion difference. That is the difference between the actual, uh, the strong ion difference and the estimated strong ion difference. So Please read around that. You will see more and more cases in the future exams. And uh, if you look at the, sorry, for the, so acidosis, uh, different acidosis are there. So different outcomes in different setups. So it's important to uh, the, do the medical reasoning rather than just applying the evidence to this part of the medicine, simply because we need to understand things based on these theories. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Manoj for that very informative presentation. Uh, with the interest of time, I don't think we can entertain questions. So I would like to present this token of appreciation 
on behalf of the Sidon College of Physicians. That ends the teaching capsule seven. So um, there will be another capsule. So please stay with us. <laughs>